Uh, we are going to continue this morning in our uh, journey through uh, the book of uh, Luke. We'll be in chapter 21. Uh, so we did first four verses of chapter 21 last week. There was so much packed into it uh, because God's word is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword. Uh, this week we're covering 24 verses and there's going to be a lot packed into it because God's word is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword. Uh, but don't worry. Uh, even though we're covering six times as many verses, the sermon will not be six times as long. Uh, four times as long tops, okay? <laughs> I promise. Um, as we read this, this passage, notice, well, there, there's going to be a lot of things that's, that's uh, in this passage. However, there, there really is this a theme that's got, that really binds uh, all of these verses together. It's very much a if, from Jesus' perspective, it's a look forward. For us, it's partially a look backward, partially a look forward. And we'll, we'll see kind of how that uh, works out. But as we read this, notice that Jesus, he, he's going to mention the destruction and the end of two different things, uh, Jerusalem and the world. Okay, he's going to talk about the destruction of Jerusalem, but also the destruction of the world, the end of the world. And he's going to kind of switch back and forth once or twice. So let's just watch out for that. Don't be confused by that. And what he's doing when he does this is he's using the destruction of Jerusalem as a, a quote-unquote pattern or type of the destruction of the world at the end of time. And, and Scripture will do that sometimes. It'll use something that happens or happened will, will foreshadow something that's going to happen later. We see this all throughout uh, Scripture. This is one of the biggest things that stuck out to me is when I read all of Scripture in a year is you get to see just, okay, this happened here, and that really was, it had, it had consequences here, but it also was a foreshadow of something else to happen later. So, so for example, many of the prophecies about Jesus coming to this earth, his incarnation, many of them uh, had a fulfillment both in that time, hundreds of years before Jesus, but also in the life of Jesus. Uh, another more specific example is Moses. Yeah, back in Exodus, uh, all the, 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 the Torah, the Pentateuch, we see the life of Moses. He is a type of Jesus, okay? a, a pattern, a foreshadowing of Jesus. Moses led God's people out of slavery in Egypt. Jesus led God's people out of slavery to sin. You see that? So sometimes the Bible will, will do this, and Jesus is, is doing that a bit here with uh, Jerusalem and the end of the world. So got a big passage today, a lot to get to. So let's uh, hop into Luke uh, 21, verses 5 through 28. And while some were speaking of the temple, I'll pause right there. Remember our setting from last week. They're in the temple, uh, watching people give their offerings. And so they're still in the temple. So some were speaking of the temple, how it was adorned with noble stones and offerings. He, Jesus said, as for these things that you see, the days will come when there will not be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. And they asked him, teacher, when will these things be? And what will be the sign when these things are about to take place? And he said, See that you are not led astray, for many will come in my name, saying, I am he, and the time is at hand. Do not go after them. And when you hear of wars and tumults, do not be terrified. For these things must first take place, but the end will not be at once. And then he said to them, Nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There will be great earthquakes, and in various places famines and pestilences, and there will be terrors and great signs from heaven. But before all this, they will lay their hands on you and persecute you, delivering you up to the synagogues and prisons, and you will be brought before kings and governors for my name's sake. This will be your opportunity to bear witness. Settle it therefore in your minds, not to meditate beforehand how to answer. For I will give you a mouth and wisdom, which none of your adversaries will be able to withstand or contradict. You will be delivered up, even by parents and brothers and relatives and friends. And some of you they will put to death. You will be hated by all for my name's sake but not a hair of your head will perish. By your endurance, you will gain your lives. Verse 20, but when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then know that its desolation has come near. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains and let those who are inside the city depart and let not those who are out in the country enter it. For these are the days of vengeance to fulfill all that is written. Alas for women who are pregnant and for those who are nursing infants in those days, for there will be great distress upon the earth and wrath against this people. They will fall by the edge of the sword and be led captive among all nations, and Jerusalem will be trampled underfoot by the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. And there will be signs and sun and moon and stars, and on the earth distress of nations and perplexity because of the roaring of the sea and the waves, people fainting with fear and with foreboding of what is coming on the world. But the powers of the heavens will be shaken. 
they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. Now, when these things begin to take place, straighten up and raise your heads because your redemption is drawing near. There's a lot there. But you can see how Jesus is really, he's talking about future events. And again, all the events he's talking about here are in the future for him. Some are in the past for us. But here's the, the big idea that he's really trying to draw his disciples' attentions to, is that amid tumultuous times, our hope is in Jesus, the victorious king. This is what we're going to just kind of work through in this passage. This is what we see as he is, he's talking about these terrible things that are going to happen. And yet, he also has some commands, some imperatives, some, some applications for us as we anticipate these things. Uh, amid tumultuous times, our hope is in Jesus, the victorious king. I want to apologize for using the word tumultuous. I wouldn't normally use a word that, that's uh, that much of a mouthful. Uh, it's very hard to spell. But man, I, I don't know. As I, was, I really, I spent more time than I should have probably looking for a synonym that had the same meaning and strength. And I don't know, I came up empty. For some reason, that word is just exactly what describes these times. And that, the, the shortened version of that word is actually in the passage. So amid tumultuous times, our hope is in Jesus, the victorious king. And I just also want to pause and note something that we, we often talk about, you know, as we preach expositionally through books of the Bible. So, you know, we're just taking what's the next passage and we cover every uh, verse, you know, in a given book. We don't know what the cultural circumstances will be uh, when we come to certain passages. We don't know what's going to be on our collective minds on any given Sunday. We don't know exactly what the, you know, the main idea of a passage is going to be until we really kind of get there and start to dig into it. But time and time again, we see God's word speak powerfully to the circumstances that are going on uh, around us. For, like, so just for instance, for the immediate aftermath of a presidential election, I don't know that I would have thought of this passage to go to for some truth to hold on to, but I would say that this big idea here is exactly what we need right now. I think this is exactly what we need to be reminded of right now, that our hope is in Jesus. And that's not really because of any, I mean, there, there's, as we look at our culture, there are people who feel all sorts of different ways. Right? But this, Jesus is really pulling us to put our faith in him, to put our trust in him amid all, among all things. And so even as we just think about the future right, of our country, there's all sorts of different ways that our culture could go. And yet Jesus wants to remind us, hey, no matter what's happening, and all these things are some of the worst case scenarios of things that can happen, that he is a victorious king. And so we're going we're gonna to work through this, this passage. So a, a, as he's talking... He's hitting on a few different topics, as we've said. So especially since this is such a long passage, I just want to give you the structure briefly of how we're going to be going through the t- uh, today. So deception and persecution will come. This is kind of the first thing that he says. Deception and persecution will come. Uh, disasters and destruction uh, will happen. Okay, that's the second thing. And then uh, the Jesus is king. Yeah, <laughs> just kidding. I just wanted to have a D there. It's okay. Jesus is king. Yeah, yeah. If we want to have some alliteration, you can put the, the D in there. Yeah, <laughs> just a little humor for you there. Let's remember, though, Jesus is in his his last week on earth, right? His last week on earth uh, of his life before death and resurrection. Uh, Let's remember he also, he's had these harsh words. Who has he had harsh words for recently? It's these religious rulers, different authorities, different scribes, Pharisees. He even even contrasts them to the poor widow in the previous passage. uh, And then previous passage before that, he really had some harsh words for them and how they take advantage of people and how they just like their long robes and attention, all these things. He's basically been saying they're focused on all the wrong things. And the the poor widow we talked about last week, she gets it. Uh, She knows that this world, that this life is not all that there is. And so that that brings us to this passage where he's bringing our attention to the end of Jerusalem, the end of all things. And what's interesting, just a small detail of this passage, but it's kind of fascinating. He uses the word will uh, 26 times. So in our English translation, 26 times our attention is drawn forward to things. So he's really saying, okay, these things will happen. Okay, there is a certainty to, the, uh, to, to the, this passage, to his words. He's painting a picture of what is to come. And so his, ma- his message is basically this. Like, things are going to get really rough, so endure. Like, persevere. Trust me. I will be victorious. So let's talk about the first thing he gets to. Deception and persecution uh, will come. So, so he, he predicts this. He predicts the, destru- the destruction of the temple. We'll talk about that more in just a second. And of, of course, people's question is, okay, he, he predicts these things. They say, teacher, when will these things be? And what will be the sign when these things are about to take place? Natural question. 
He said, see that you are not led astray, for many will come in my name, saying, I am he, the time is at hand. Do not go after them. When you hear of wars and tumults, do not be terrified, for these things must first take place, but the end will not be at once. So it's interesting. People are going to claim to be Jesus. People who are not Jesus are going to come and claim to be Jesus, this, this is, must have been a pretty wild prediction to his listeners, which included his disciples. People say, you know, people are going to claim to be me. You know, he's like, you know, they're, they're basically, they're going to steal my Facebook account password and send you a friend request, <laughs> right? Like they're going to they're gonna try to pretend to be me, but don't be fooled by them. Like, it's, it's a wild thing that he's predicting, but have we seen this play out in the years since then? Absolutely, we have. In our very own city, there is a church called the World Mission Society of God. They have a building uh, not far from here, actually, just a few miles from where we are right now. Uh, They're very active, not only on the UTA campus, they're very active. They have a student organization there. But if you go to Walmart, you go to Target in this city, you hang out long enough or short enough, you're going to talk to one of them. Um, Many, many, I know, of you have been approached by them at various places in the city. Now, there are several things that are wrong with their beliefs. We're not going to dive deep into it. That's for another time. I'll only briefly mention a couple of these today. Uh, One is that they believe that God is both father and mother, and that uh, the mother is currently alive in Korea today. Um, But secondly, they believe that Jesus has already come back. Okay, so they believe that Jesus' second coming has already happened. Uh, his name was Christ An Song Gong. Uh, he was born in 1914, uh, sorry, 1918, and then uh, died in 1985, sadly. Again, maybe, I'm not exactly sure what their uh, beliefs on that, but he did not rise from the dead this time. So they, they believe that Jesus has already returned, and he was a guy who lived in Korea uh, in the mid-1900s. Um, just Spoiler alert, that was not Jesus, okay? This is what Jesus is talking about uh, in Luke 21. I actually found a list uh, from Wikipedia, of all places, that had a list of people who claim to be Jesus. Uh, there are all sorts of uh, you know, sources cited on this Wikipedia list. It actually went back a few hundred years. I just started counting from 1800. So 224 years ago, I just started counting, and there were 52 people they had on this list who claimed to be Jesus, and I'm sure they're missing at least another 52, if not more, right? But at least 52 people since 1800 have come claiming to be Jesus in some way. And most of them started a cult and gained somewhat of a following. And Jesus says simply in verse 8, do not go after them. I will see it at the end of this passage. But when Jesus comes back a second time, there's going to be no question that it is him. Okay, like when, when his description just in this passage, not to mention many other passages, his description of his second coming is such that we, there's going to be no doubt. So if you're ever wondering, if you ever have this, this thought of, is this person the second coming of Jesus? The very thought, the very fact that you are wondering means the answer is nope. <laughs> okay, this, that, that's kind of an easy test for, is this, is this the second coming of Jesus? And, and the best thing I can encourage all of us to do, to avoid deception, to do what Jesus says here, to, to avoid being taken in by anyone, is to stay connected to God's word, stay connected to God's people. So someone who is familiar with the breadth of God's word, not just specific passages, right, that might say something that you can kind of blow up into a whole, uh, you know, framework of theology. You know, the breadth of God's word, someone who is connected with God's people, will not find themselves deceived by anyone who's claiming to be Jesus. So do not be led astray, as Jesus says here. So people are going to claim to be Jesus. But secondly, Jesus says persecution will come. Okay, so he's saying, okay, this is something else that's going to happen for followers of Jesus. Verse 12 and then verses 16 and 17 uh, give some some descriptions here. So verses uh, uh, 10 and 11, he kind of leading into 12, he gives this description of a conflict that's going to happen. But then verse 12, he says, but before all of this, before all this conflict, they will lay their hands on you and persecute you, delivering you up to the synagogues and prisons, and you'll be brought before kings and governors for my name's sake. That's verse 12, and then 16 and 17, he says, you will be delivered up even by parents and brothers and relatives and friends. And some of you they will put to death, and you'll be hated by all for my name's sake. These are vivid descriptions of what the first followers of Jesus are going to endure. And we we can be reasonably sure Jesus is more focusing on the people he's talking to who are in front of them. This isn't necessarily one that would get totally applied to us. So in, in some ways it might, but he, he mentioned specifically synagogues, for instance. So there seem to be some details. He's, he's telling the people in front of him, this is going to happen for you in the immediate future. We are reasonably certain from, from church tradition, from historical sources, that at least 11 out of the 12 disciples were killed for their faith, for their witness specifically. And this is in line with what Jesus has already told them. We've seen this in Luke before, back in chapter 14, verse 28. 
he told his disciples to count the costs of following him. Right? He, he's made it very clear so far that, yeah, following me is not going to be easy and it might end in your death. But it is worth it. It's also worth noting that in verse 12, when Jesus says that people will seize the disciples, bring them before kings, bring them before governors. Th these are the people who had power over life and death in those days. That, that's what he's saying. But Jesus adds that the reason that these people, that his disciples before him, they're going to be brought before these authorities is, quote, for my name's sake. And that's a key phrase, for my name's sake. What does that mean? It means that they will be persecuted because of their allegiance to Jesus and not because of anything else. Okay, this is something we often see. There's other places in scripture that talk about the, the, the persecution for the sake of the name of Jesus. Now, I just want to say, as Christians in 21st century America, we can have a quick trigger finger to claim persecution, right? I think we can have maybe a bit, a bit too quick of a trigger finger to claim this is persecution. And while, while I know that the, the trend of American culture over time has been a downward one as far as the, the culture's view of Christians we've seen out of the last 20, 30, 40 years, it's certainly been downward. I think too often these instances can uh, be mingled with maybe disagreements over political policy, and we can kind of mingle them and call them uh, persecution. But, you know, just because someone who is a Christian is having, say, may maybe their First Amendment rights, which is a big deal, maybe having them trampled in some way does not mean that they're being persecuted for being a Christian. There there's, there's, a, there's a difference here, and, and, and both can be addressed in their own way. But we don't want to mingle and call something persecution that it's not. And at, at Southfield, we often summarize you know, our, our goal like this. If you are hated, if you are persecuted, make sure it is for the name of Jesus, for the sake of the name of Jesus, for the sake of his gospel. Like make sure that it's because you are defying a government authority for the sake of obedience to the call of Jesus and not just because you wanted to be right about something. Okay? And then we, we've, we've got to just check our hearts about this. The last thing I'll say about this is that Jesus is saying that allegiance to him is going to cause divisions in families. And this is a hard one. Allegiance to the call of Jesus is going to cause divisions in families. If one part of a family remains hostile to the cause of the gospel, Jesus is saying that there can be and will be betrayal of Christians in the family. Because when the, book, when the gospel message is believed and lived, it changes things. It changes who our hearts are drawn to. It changes the very nature of our lives. And Jesus is saying there's, there's going to be divisions in families because of the sake of his name. We've seen he, he's, he's gone deeper into this in the previous passages in Luke. And so as believers, let us not be surprised when we encounter negative treatment for the sake of Jesus, whether it be from culture, whether it be from our family. So deception and persecution will come. He also says disasters and destruction will happen. The bulk of what Jesus talks about is talking about these disasters, this destruction. Now, now I know when reading a passage like this, the tendency is to try to maybe decipher, maybe try to figure out when Jesus is coming back. And I think we know people have, have tried this again and again. Uh, we, we can put that, that idea to rest that we're going to figure out when he's coming back based on what's going on in the world. And Jesus does not give us a timeline or even a clear, unmistakable picture of what the conditions will be like right before he returns. And in other places in scripture, he says, he says the son does not even know the timing. The son in his human nature did not even know the timing of the father returning. We certainly do not. What he does describe here is what the near future will be uh, for, for Jerusalem and then globally what the world will experience in the coming days. And he doesn't give a timeline of what, of what that will be. But in verse 9, he does say this. Verse 9, when you hear of wars and tumults, do not be terrified, for these things must first take place, but the end will not be at once. There's that word tumult. That's another, that's the reason I kept the word tumultuous in our big idea for this passage. So amid these tumultuous times, our hope is in Jesus, the victorious king. And so what Jesus is basically saying here is that terrible events will happen. Do not be surprised. Okay, very basic sentence, but this is, this is what he's getting. He's saying these, these terrible events will happen. Don't be surprised when they happen. Now, some of these things that Jesus predicts will be fulfilled within 50 years of the time that he's talking some of the things that Jesus predicts and says here have not yet been fulfilled. As we can see, he's predicting the destruction of many things, and, and the temple is included here. Let's talk about that first, the destruction of the temple. 
Because Luke opens up this passage by saying that there was this conversation going on about how great the temple was. And then Jesus comes in and says, the days will come when there will not be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. Uh, first of all, man, what a buzzkill, Jesus. I, <laughs> I mean, they're talking about how great it is, and he's like, yeah, it's going to be destroyed. But, you know, it's, it's important. We know that Jesus, in the last week of his life, every word that he speaks has meaning, is laden with, with, with great meaning for his listeners. And so they do well to listen. We do well to listen to him. And what he's basically getting at here, at here is that even things that seem permanent will not last. Okay, this is one of the things that comes out of his, his prediction of the temple. Even things that seem permanent will not last. Don't put your faith in them. Nations, buildings, political parties, types of government, all of these things will fall. It's hard, it's really hard for us to, to fully realize how wild of a prediction this was. I, I wonder if maybe a similar prediction, it would be like somebody saying that, that America, the United States of America will one day fall. Like for us, that's hard to imagine, right? We have a, a strong nation right now, strong government. I know yeah, there's, there's all sorts of tumults going on right now, but it's hard to imagine, right? The United States of America eventually falling, but it will. Jesus is saying this temple is going to fall. The temple was truly magnificent. This temple was the center of so much of the life of the Israelites at the time. Uh, here's a, a picture of, of a rendering of what it might have looked like at the time. And many believe that, I mean, this temple really rivaled even the seven wonders of the ancient world and its thighs and its beauty and its design. Uh, R.C. Sproul, the pastor, he preacher, he talks about how during Jesus' younger years, uh, so they, during his time when he was alive, about 20, maybe 25 years before this time, Herod, who was the Roman ruler of that era, he started adding on to the temple, making it even more glorious than before. And, and to be clear, this temple was a rebuilding of Solomon's temple, which was already demolished a few hundred years earlier, but it was rebuilt. And then Herod, a few years before Jesus, uh, speaking here, started adding to it even more, making it better. To do this, he had these massive stones that were brought from stone uh, quarries. These stones were 67 feet long, uh, seven feet high and nine feet wide, 67 feet long. So I did, I did some measuring. Stephen helped me out with some measuring before this. Uh, this room is about 34 feet wide. And so about twice the length of this room, twice the, the, the width of this room, two times the width of this room was the length of one of these stones. Seven feet high, nine feet wide. These were the types of stones he had brought in to, to uh, re rebuild and add on and make the temple even more glorious than it was before. And Jesus says that in Luke 21, that a time will come and when not one of these stones will be left on top of the other. Like we're not, we're not talking about little stones here. We're talking about massive things that had a sense of permanence and wonder and awe. And that prophecy came true. Almost 40 years later, AD 70, the Roman army marched against Jerusalem, invaded it, destroyed the temple, literally breaking every stone down to the ground. Literally not leaving one stone on top of the other. The, the Jewish historian Josephus, not necessarily a follower of Jesus, said that almost 100,000 Jews were taken prisoner. He said that over a million Jews were killed in this invasion and the destruction of Jerusalem. It was truly a devastating event for Israel. And this happened less than 40 years after Jesus predicted it. And Jesus describes these events, the, the events of Jerusalem's fall, verses 20 through 24, describes it a bit more. He laments the fact that vulnerable, pe vulnerable people, uh, pregnant women, women with young nursing infants will be affected by this and suffer greatly. He really, he really laments that fact. And see, all of this is happening amid the plan of God being unfolded. His plans, his purposes are always being accomplished amid the brokenness, amid the flawed nature of human beings. And I, I, know, I know this is cheesy, but I, I just, I, it's just true. When we call history his story, right? <laughs> you ever seen that before? You know, we have history, but it really is his story. I know it's cheesy, but it's a good way of just kind of think, reminding ourselves that like, yeah, what, what happens in the world God is sovereign. Now, here's the thing. If God is sovereign, if he knows why these, and he knows that these terrible events will happen, why doesn't he stop them? That might, that might have entered your head. It certainly entered my head as I was reading this. If Jesus is truly God in the human flesh and he knows 
that these things are going to happen? Why is he just predicting them and not stopping them? The way that this thought is put forward by those who are trying to maybe disprove God, bring up an an objection against his existence or his goodness, they'll say this, if God is both all powerful and all good, how could destruction like this happen? Either he isn't all powerful or he isn't all good. Okay, this this is a very common uh, uh, statement that is put up against the either power or the goodness of God. And and, and the answer starts... uh, the answer to this really could be a whole sermon in and of itself, but it starts back in Genesis 1 through 3. We learn about God's perfect creation. We learn about the destructive effects of sin that entered into that perfect creation. And from that point on, what we see is God working through terrible events and showing his goodness and showing his power and showing ultimately his love. And here's the thing. God does not promise his people that terrible events will not happen. We really don't see this from, from beginning to end of Scripture. He never promises and says, that, no, like, no, your lives are going to be amazing no matter what. No, but what he does promise is he's going to be with them through it. Amid the brokenness, amid the fallen nature of the world, he will be with them. And see, here, here's kind of the, the, the center of, of this question or center of maybe the answer to approaching this question. It's ultimately short-sighted. This question is ultimately short-sighted. We as humans tend to have a much shorter perspective than God does. That's often a problem when we come to to thinking about who God is and maybe wrestling with why he acts or why is he the way that he is. A lot of times when we hit a, a, like a snag or we don't understand something, it's because our perspective is much shorter than his is. Our understanding is finite and his is infinite. We think in terms of months and years. God acts in terms of centuries and millennia. Like when it comes to him accomplishing his will for this world, his, his perspective is much longer than ours. The Bible is full of stories where people lived their entire lives, entire generations came and went inside the timeline of God working out his ultimate plan. So be patient. Trust God. He, he knows what he is doing. And we're going gonna to get to really the, the, the final thought that helps us answer this question at the end of this passage. But near near the end of this passage, verses 25 and 26, Jesus says this, and there will be signs and sun and moon and stars on the earth, distress of nations and perplexity because of the roaring of the sea and of the waves, people fainting with fear, with foreboding of what is coming on in the world for the powers of the heavens will be shaken. I don't know about you, when I'm reading this, I'm like, wow, that sounds kind of familiar. We've seen some of these things lately. They're they're not new. Uh, We've seen unique behavior from the sun, moon, and stars. I I think it was, was it April of this past year? Was the total eclipse? Was that April? Yeah, April, the the, the, the eclipse, amazing eclipse, like a a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to see something like that. Nations are in distress today. Uh, Because of the roaring of the sea and the waves, right? You know, every week you can read something about how we we are, uh, maybe a nation or a people is worried about something that's happening because of the sea, because of the oceans. Our own country was hit twice in the last two months with massive hurricanes. Many more disasters related to the sea happen every single year all across the world. Does this mean that Jesus is coming back any minute? Not necessarily. Like I said, be careful of shortening God's timeline. Be careful of of shrinking what Jesus says and what God's plan is to, it's got to apply to my life and in my lifetime. Again, Jesus is basically saying here, terrible events will happen. Don't be surprised. And I'll add to don't be surprised. Also, don't be afraid. Why? Why shouldn't we be afraid? That's because of the next two verses, verses 27 and 28. These are the last two in today's passage. After all these predictions of what will happen, Jesus says this, and then they will see the son of man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. And when these things begin to take place, straighten up and raise your heads because your redemption is drawing near. See, so far, Jesus has predicted lots of wild events, lots of crazy things, and he acknowledged, he's acknowledged that fear will be a natural, maybe a common reaction to them. But in these verses, he gives us a reason for hope. Now, first of all, he refers to himself as the son of man. 
and they will see the Son of Man. We, we've seen this in Luke before. This, this title is only used by Jesus to refer to himself. Nobody else uses it in Scripture to refer to Jesus. It's used in the Gospels 80 times. And this, this title, Son of Man, comes from Daniel chapter 7 in the Old Testament, where Daniel, he refers to the Father. So we've got Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Daniel refers to the Father as Ancient of Days. And they, so then he says, And behold, with the clouds of heaven, there came one like a son of man. And he came to the ancient of days and was presented before him. And to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all people's nations and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away. And his kingdom, one that shall not be destroyed. And so when Jesus uses this phrase, son of man, here in Luke 21 and other passages in Luke, his Jewish listeners would have been very familiar with this passage from this background from Daniel. Uh, Jesus is basically saying, amid all of this deception, amid all the betrayal, amid all the persecution that I just predicted, I am not only king through it all, I am returning to make it all new again. I, I really don't think there's another scripture that expands on this passage better. In Revelation 19, 11 through 16, Apostle John writing a revelation, he says this. This is referring to the end of all things on this earth. John says, then I saw heaven opened and behold a white horse. And the one sitting on it is called faithful and true. And in righteousness, he judges and makes war. His eyes are like a flame of fire and on his head are many diadems. And he has a name written that no one knows but himself. He is clothed in a robe dipped in blood. And the name by which he is called is the word of God. And the armies of heaven, arrayed in fine linen, white and pure, were following him on white horses. From his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron. He will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God the Almighty. On his robe and on his thigh, he has a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. We do not have to fear anything that Jesus predicts in this passage. He doesn't want us to. We do not have to let the fear of any one of these things that he predicts dominate our thoughts and lead us to a place of fear, lead us to a place of anxiety, or maybe a place of dread. Why? Because Jesus is king. We don't have to fear who is in power in our country. As we actively work to see the heart of God worked out in our culture around us, we don't have to fear when it doesn't happen the way that we want it. And we don't have to place our faith in a person when it does happen the way that we want it. Why? Because Jesus is king. And so now the question is, okay, what do we do in the meantime? We've touched on a couple of things. What do we do? Well, Jesus, he gives some clarity in his teaching in the passage, and he gives some clarity of things that we should do. And then there's a couple other things that I think we can glean from this passage. So he says a few imperatives, some, some, some commands. Let's, let's look at those first. So briefly in verse 8, we talked about this. He said, see that you are not led astray by the deception of people claiming to be him. Uh, we talked about being grounded in his word, grounded in community, which will help you avoid that. Uh, Ephesians 4.11 says that he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and teachers to help believers avoid being deceived. You'll only receive this ministry. This ministry will only benefit you if you are attached to the body of Christ. Secondly, he says, verse 9, do not be terrified. This, this is vital. Like Jesus is giving prediction, again, of, of truly terrifying things. Like we're, we're, we're talking the very nature of nature, right? Being up in an upheaval. Especially for his Jewish listeners who would have included the destruction of the temple, right? Many of whom would, they would still be alive when this would start to come to pass. But see here, Jesus gives one of 365 times in the Bible that God says some form of do not be afraid. Do you know that? 365 times God says, do not be afraid, do not fear, do not be terrified. One for each day of the year. Do not be afraid. Do not let fear define your life or your actions. Bad things will happen. Don't be shocked. Be grounded in the sovereignty. Be grounded in the goodness of God. So then he talks about how they're going to be persecuted, brought before these authorities, right, for judgment. Verse 13, 
He says, this will be your opportunity to what? To bear witness. Bear witness to what? Bear witness to whom? Bear witness to the truth of the gospel of Jesus. This is, this is what he's, he's talking about. Bear witness basically means here's what I've seen, here's what I know, and here's what you should do because of that. that that's basically what it means to bear witness. Here, here's what I've, I've seen this, I've experienced this. This is what I know. This is what I'm calling you to do on the basis of that. So basically his disciples can say, I've been with Jesus. I've seen him do miracles. I've experienced his teaching. He is God in the flesh, come to give us salvation. And then that's what it means for them to bear witness. And this is fulfilled literally weeks after Jesus has died, after he's risen, after he's ascended to the right hand of the Father. The disciples, Peter and John specifically, they're arrested. They're brought before the authorities. Check. Fulfills Jesus' prediction there. They bear witness to the gospel of Jesus and they call everyone who is listening to respond to it and to believe it. So, and then, so they, they do all of these things. And then in Acts 4, 13, we read, now when they, the authorities, saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated common men, they were astonished and they recognized that they had been with Jesus. So the authorities connected directly the actions, the words, the attitude of these disciples and they connected it directly with, wow, they've, they've been with Jesus. It's because the disciples are bearing witness amid these things. How can you bear witness to Jesus this week? How can you bear witness to the truth of the gospel? How can you bear witness to what God has done in your life this week? I want to challenge each of you, ask God for an opportunity to do that this week. Next is trust God's word. We trust God's word. When, when Jesus was talking about the fall of Jerusalem in verse 22, he says, for these things are days of vengeance to fulfill all that is written. So again, he's making this connection between what's going to happen and, and this, was, this has already been predicted even in God's word that had been written at that time. What was written, what was written <laughs> that would lead to what Jesus is talking about here. There's, there's several things, a few. I, I'm only going to mention a couple here. Uh, 1 Kings 6, God promises Solomon that if his people depart from his commands, then the temple that he built would be destroyed. Now, that had already happened, but the same principle applies with, even with this new temple. The people depart from his commands and the temple that he built would be destroyed. Micah 3, we read that if the rulers of Israel, if they detest, detest justice, they make crooked all that is straight and fill Jerusalem with iniquity and then pretend that everything is all good, then, quote, Jer Jerusalem shall become a heap of ruins. These were the conditions of Jerusalem at the time of Jesus and they only got worse from there. And all that was written in the prophets and spoken by Jesus happened exactly like they said. We can trust God's word, even when, maybe especially when, it talks about things that are unpleasant. I say especially because that might be when we need to lean in a little more. We might be more resistant to God's word if it's predicting something unpleasant for our lives. But we can trust that God's word is true, living, and will come to pass in our lives, which leads us to our next application, which is this, prepare in the good times for the bad times. This is not one that Jesus says plainly, but I'm adding it because it easily comes out of this passage. Right now, the experiences of a Christian in America is nothing close to what Jesus describes here. I can say with confidence that no, no one in here is going to be brought before authorities simply, before, simply for being a Christian. Like in this coming week, I can say with a confidence that none of you are going to be experience that, going to be brought before someone simply because you're being a Christian. Um, the, the president that was just elected, he favors Christians. However, now is not the time to be spiritually lazy. Now is not the time to sit back and just relax. Now is not the time to settle and just trust in calm circumstances. Because frankly, times of cultural favor can and has made weak Christians. This is a tendency of cultural favor. Christians whose hope is in cultural favor and cultural power rather than the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. That, that's, what, that's what calm cultural circumstances can create. We can depend even sometimes unconsciously on the favor and the power that we have in the culture rather than on Jesus. And one problem with that is that when, not if, when the political wind shifts, the next person who is in power, then it's like a rug that has been pulled out from under their feet. You see that? And that, that can, it can shift very quickly. We've seen this throughout history. 
the attitude of nations, the attitude of government towards believers can change very quickly. So now more than ever, establish your foundation in the hope that Jesus gives. Because then if and when that whole st- that the culture becomes hostile, then we will be prepared. Nothing will have changed. Because no matter what, no matter who is in power, no matter the mindset of culture towards believers, our hope is always in Jesus. That's always our foundation. And then we live in and influence the culture from that place. Does that make sense? Because we, we, we cannot get those things switched around. Now, you know, preparing good times for the bad times, I'm not saying you need to be a doomsday prepper, digging a bomb shelter in your backyard, right? Stockpiling food to last you for years. Now, the food thing could be wise, though. Talk to Richard Hartman for details there. He's got some thoughts for you, (laughs) honestly. (laughs) Yeah, that actually could be a good idea. But you do need to be a prepper for persecution, okay? We need to be preppers for persecution. And I'm not saying it's coming anytime soon. I'm not even saying it would have come had the other candidate won the election. But it turns out that what God calls us to every day is exactly the same thing that we need to do to prepare for times of hostility against our faith. And what is that? It's trust his word, lean into the hope that we have in Jesus. And that leads us to our last thing for today. This last verse of our passage, verse 28, Jesus says this. Now, when these things begin to take place, straighten up, raise your heads, because your redemption is drawing near. Straighten up. Raise your heads. See, body language means something. It communicates something. It gives us a look into what's going on inside of us, right? If, if you're hunched over, head down, like looking at the floor, like what, what does that mean? What does that communicate? Uh, probably that you're ready for the sermon to be done, right? <laughs> no, it's, no, but that, that, that's like a timidity. That's an that's a insecurity. It's a lack of confidence, potentially, depending on the, on the situation. Body language communicates something. But if your shoulders are back, your head is up, you're calmly surveying your surroundings, what does that communicate? It's security. It's confidence. That person has hope in something. Straighten up. Raise your heads. Several years ago, Shauna and I, we uh, watched a popular NBC show called uh, This Is Us, fascinating show. One of the episodes, there's the the husband, uh, Miguel. He's uh, talking with his wife, Rebecca, and he's telling this story about about grapes that are grown in Italy. And uh, there's a town called Montecino in Italy. He talks about the grapes and how they they do it. And he explains that the the townspeople of this little town, Montecino in Italy, they have to wait for the weather to cooperate in order for the grapes to come. Sometimes it's too hot. Sometimes it's too cold. Years can pass before the weather is good enough for a crop of grapes to actually grow and come. And Miguel, he explains this. And then he says this, he says, the townspeople, they have to wait out the bad years, believing the better years are coming. They have to wait out the bad years, believing the better years are coming. And I I heard that and immediately I was like, that's, that's what we as believers do. We wait out these bad years, believing the better years are coming. But this belief is not just a whimsical hope. It's not just a a feeling, not just a, I hope that happens. No, it's based on something real. It's based on something that is sure. And this is what Jesus is leading us to in this passage. It's based on the reality of his life, his teachings, what he did for us when his death It's based on the reality of his resurrection. It's based on the reality of his ascension to the right hand of the throne of the Father. The fact that he reigns as king today. So amid tumultuous times, our hope is in Jesus, our victorious king. Lean into him this week. Why don't you bow your heads with me? We're going to pray as we finish today. God, there are many things that you call us to, God, and sometimes we can maybe get overwhelmed with how many things are in Scripture that talk about what we need to do for you. But God, I I just pray that right now we would just settle in the simple fact that Jesus is the King, and any hope that is placed in him is 
a sure hope. It is a well-placed hope. And so God, I, I, I pray, God, that if there is maybe a tumultuous heart in any of us, maybe there is a storm of circumstances, maybe mindsets or thoughts or worries or anxieties that is in any of us based on what's in this passage or based on something in our lives. God, no matter what it is, I pray that your peace that passes all understanding would overwhelm it. God, that you would draw our eyes to Jesus, that we would fix our eyes on him. God, that we as a church would prepare in in these good times for the bad times. God, that we would settle our hearts on you and that our foundation would be in Christ and nothing else. God, help us to be good citizens of our cities, of our state, of our country. God, may we love each other well, all anticipating, God, when you will come and make all things new again. So we love you and we look to you this morning. And it's in the name of Jesus that I pray these things. Amen.